Oh, hello, everybody. Blessings to you. Here we are, Galatians. And can you believe we're on lesson number six? Okay, lesson number six. Uh, yeah, Lynn, bring that up. That, that envy thing is an interesting thing about that when we get to that in a minute. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, Rachel just showed us a really, really good looking chocolate trumpet ice cream cone. <clears throat> so we're all sort of lusting after that. So anyway, this is lesson six. If the Lord's willing, we're actually going to finish Galatians next week, <clears throat> which um, I entirely anticipate being able to do. But I, I do want to forewarn you, I've got a daughter that's supposed to have a baby here in about a week or so. And so if y'all uh, get a Facebook post from me saying, hey, uh, we got to change the schedule, that's going to be the reason. I don't anticipate that, but, uh, you know, everything's just sort of up in the air because we're going to get a call and have to make a 12-hour drive pretty quick. <laughs> so... We're just playing it by ear, you know. So uh, anyway, um, uh, let's pray together. I have a feeling we may be going a little different kind of way tonight in what we do. Maybe not, but uh, uh, because we've been talking before class right here with several of us, and God's just been revealing a lot of stuff in what we've been studying. Um, as you pray, uh, do pray for my daughter, Lindsay, uh, the one that's been in the hospital, you know, so much since last October. She's actually spent the last week in the hospital. She went in last Tuesday, uh, but she's getting out. I think like right now, I think, I don't know who's doing it, but somebody's driving an hour south to pick her up right now at the moment. And so uh, <coughs> uh, she's doing fine, doing well. She just, you know, has little setbacks with fluid on the lungs and things like that. So anyway, Father, I, I thank you for what you are revealing to us, what you are saying to us, what you are teaching us, um, especially uh, through this portion of your word. And so, Lord, I uh, thank you for what you've revealed this week, and I just ask that you will continue to give us understanding, not only from this week, not only tonight, uh, but for the balance of our time here on earth. Lord, just teach us, show us your truth, and we thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, uh, just real, real quick, not even so much a review, but yeah, sort of a review, Uh what has you learned so far from the book of Galatians that has uh, either really impacted you or that's been really beneficial to you or where you find yourself in life? So tell me, what has Galatians spoke to you? Rachel is singing the theme song from the Lego movie, Everything is Awesome. <laughs> yeah, what's awesome? Uh, isn't that the truth, Rachel? Every, it's so relevant today. And I, I think uh, you see this, that God does this kind of stuff. We have experienced it for about 17 years here locally. That many, many times, and I'm talking probably like 8, 9, 10 different times, there has been a commonality of what the Lord is releasing within the community. Uh, I remember when we were studying John, uh, the local Baptist churches were studying John in their Sunday school classes. Right now, we're studying Galatians. Uh, my son-in-law in North Carolina is preaching through Galatians. His church is going through Galatians. Uh, the Methodist church I'm at now helping with worship. Their Sunday school lessons uh, for the recent weeks have been on Galatians. And and I know all the precept people, a lot of them are doing this new course in Galatians. Uh, and it is. It's very, very relevant. I think God is wanting to say something uh, to us. <clears throat> so what else? What has been the issue so far in the first four chapters? What are the things that uh, Paul are, is covering, and why was he covering them? <laughs> yeah. well, isn't that a sad statement there, Barbara, that you're not bad for embracing your freedom in the Lord? Yeah. And I think what's really been revealed to me more and more is that most of the body of Christ, I'm talking about true believers, uh, do not know how free they are. Yeah, Kimberly, that, that's a big thing. Uh, that whole Jesus plus thing. And I know that's a common phraseology for it, but it's absolutely accurate. Yeah, uh, and good people want to pull you away into doing what they do, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. So what was the... Uh, um, the problem here with these churches in Galatia that uh, Paul was addressing. 
Oh, I like that, Lynn. Yeah, you're either all in. You can't sit on the fence. You're either all in with Christ. Uh, if anything, if you come along, if it's Jesus Christ plus anything else, forget it. And Christ doesn't mean the checklist at a church. Woo! How many times have we sat through those checklists there in various ways? And, and you know, it's so hard. I mean, I understand because we are told to uh, make disciples. Okay? We're told to grow. We're told to do some things. But to do things and then to do them in the way that the Lord is leading us in our generation, in our time. Uh, hey, Kimmy. Uh, to do that without taking on uh, uh, the self-imposed burden of a law, a man-made law, it's a very subtle thing, and we have to be so careful with it. So, so careful. Uh, so, uh, what was going on with the Galatians? They were being tempted to do what? Yeah, to add law to their faith, to go back to the law. Um uh, which is interesting because most of the Galatians were, what was their background? And that's it, yeah, adding to the message of the gospel. Most of the Galatians that he was writing to, their background was what? Yeah, they were Gentiles, exactly. <clears throat> Gentile. And and they were being tempted because of some people that had come in. Uh, they had come from a Jewish background. Some of them, I think, were actually saved. I think they were true believers though that they were ignorant about what they were saying some of them i know weren't because paul called them false brethren remember that and in the first chapter he said these folks are coming in they're bringing a different gospel and they have an agenda right here and the agenda is not good okay remember that they had they they want to disturb you and they want to distort the gospel of christ those two d's they want to disturb and they want to distort the same thing happens today, to keep the law, to keep the circumcision. Yeah, And so Paul gives a great deal of information about himself, what happened with him. And particularly the first two chapters, he, he does throughout, but particularly the first two chapters. Yeah, isn't that, isn't that incredibly? Just in case this, in case this Messiah thing isn't enough. But Paul uh, tells a lot about himself, and I think he's doing that from the perspective of uh, addressing accusations that had been made against him. We don't have those accusations written out forthrightly, but I think he's dealing with things that were being said, and you see that in a lot of places. And and then he's telling them, you don't want to go back into this. The whole third and fourth chapter, he's given examples of uh, uh, particularly Abraham, how Abraham uh, was justified by faith. And he says, you don't need to be tempted in that. Is, is this type of thing uh, something that happens today? Does this happen today within the body of Christ? And by that I mean the um, being tempted to go back or to bring forth a law, some form of a man-made law. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> Rachel didn't think so. Uh, hey, Rachel, can you uh, uh, tell them? Uh, Rachel and I were talking uh, a while ago, uh, like 45 minutes ago. Well, there you go, Kimberly. Yeah. Uh, uh, Rachel, tell them what you told me about uh, those folks. Can you do that? Wow, did y'all get all that? Did you hear what happened there with sort of the the progression 
uh, they come along and they say, okay, yeah, uh, we believe that we're saved by grace and we believe we're saved by faith, but that we're to keep the commandments and if the keeping of the commandments is the working out of the law. Yeah, that's exactly it, Sabrina. At least from one thing to the next. And then the gentleman, the individual gentleman, he went from being a, a professing what he said he was a Christian, then a Messianic Jew, and now he just says that he's a Torah-believing Jew and he totally rejects the new covenant. That's it, Sabrina. People always want something to do. So what, and, and, and that's not necessarily a bad thing, okay? I, I think we're actually designed by God in that way. But this fifth chapter, and uh, Rachel, we didn't talk about this a while ago, but I think this might be a good thing to sort of start sharing in various ways. <clears throat> this fifth chapter addresses a lot of that, okay? At the very beginning of the fifth chapter, he says, It was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. Yeah, the, oh, there's phenomenal things to do, okay? Ephesians 2 talks about walking the works prepared beforehand, okay? Yeah, but and throughout in Paul's writings, I think in four or five of his letters, he says the same thing, to stand firm, stand firm, to stand firm in the freedom. But there's something that he tells us to do in the fifth chapter. <coughs> Excuse me, guys. And um, it's, it's very forthright the way he says it, but it's easy to miss it as something to do and as a deed. Did y'all catch what it is? There is a one word thing that we're called to do as a believer that is the entire synopsis of living out the life of the law in and through the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jan Link. There you go. You can catch that down in the 14th verse. He says, for the whole law is fulfilled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Paul was saying this. Oh, you want a law? You want a law to go by? You want something to go by? Then here's what it is. How about the law of love? Okay? The law of love. And when you start seeing that, you say, oh, I see what's going on. Uh, uh, John Phillips is the guy that writes, uh, well, did write. He died, I think, five, six, seven years ago. Um, he's a Welsh preacher. And one of those guys that has the thick, voice and rolls all of his r's like that you know but his commentaries are usually quite useful and in this case it's very useful <coughs> because he actually made a statement like that oh these folks wanted the law and in the fifth and sixth chapter of galatians which is as paul often did in his writing the practical points right in other words he started from the first thing stand firm don't go be subject to the yoke of slavery but there's four different laws that he gives. You want to live under a law? There's the law of liberty in Christ. That's what you have in the first 15 verses here, chapter 5. And then you have the law of likeness of Christ. Uh, uh, Phillips was real big on alliteration, okay? And that's the balance of the fifth chapter. And then, uh, the let me see, where's the other one? Uh, the law of the love of Christ. You have that in the first six chapters, chapter 6. And then the law of life in Christ. But you see what the operative thing is. You have liberty. Uh, you have likeness. You have love. And you have life. And they're all in Christ. Well, boy, I tell you what. If you love alliteration, you will love uh, John Phillips or Warren Wiersbe. Both of them are alliterating fiends, you know. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're quite, quite good at it. And it is helpful, you know. Uh, I love what Phillips did with his, uh, well, at least his uh, editors and the book publishers. Uh, because, you know, when you read these things, he lays out his entire books along these outlines. But they put the whole entire outline of the book at the front of the book. And so I did it just then. I grabbed the book and I looked at it and there it all is on one page. And, you, you know, all of us are teachers in various forms. And you know how useful that is. <clears throat> but uh, that's what happens. Uh, man wants a law. They want something like that. Oh, you want a law? Here's the law that we're to live under, the Lord Jesus Christ, and it's the law of love. Okay, it's the law of love. Uh, so, Rachel, we, we will continue to pray that the Lord will give you uh, <clears throat> the exact words to say, okay, in each one of these things. Uh, it is hard because uh, quite often uh, it's like a, a give and take kind of thing. They come back at you with this. Uh, I, that, I just love that example because that is exactly 
what was happening with these churches in Galatia. And that's the whole point the Spirit led Paul to write this letter right here is to deal with that type of uh, different gospel. And see, that's what you can really tell them is it's a different gospel that you're talking about. Yeah, there is that religious spirit there, Barbara. Yeah, of, of no fruit. So anyway, from the beginning of the fifth chapter, Paul is sitting there saying, stand firm, don't be subject again. And he says, if you receive circumcision, Christ will be of no benefit to you. In other words, if you're a Gentile and you're a believer, and these folks are telling you you've got to be circumcised, it's going to be a great benefit, there's no way it's going to be a benefit. And, but then he said in verse 3, I testify again to every man who receives circumcision that he is under obligation to keep the whole law. So Lynn asked a great question again before we started class. We may have to start recording these pre-class conversations. We cover everything from circumcision to uh, different gospel uh, to peanut butter to the weather in New Zealand. <clears throat> I mean, you know, it's just it's everything. But Lynn had a great question. Lynn, what was your great question? Is Lynn still here? Yeah, she's here. Okay. Isn't that a great question? Who wants to answer it? <clears throat> you don't have to answer it, but who wants to respond to it? How's that? So back off and look at the big picture. <clears throat> when you see a word, what's the first thing you need to do with that word? Regardless of what the word is when you're reading it. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, in other words, it's not, uh, Rachel, it's not a, uh, it's not the default position anymore. That's it, Jan. You look at the context. You have to look at the context that the word is being used in. And so sometimes within the context of the verse, it is actually talking about the physical act of circumcision. For instance, um, in verse 2, and in verse 3, when he's talking about this, he said, if someone receives this, then you're under the obligation to keep the whole law. And it's talking about the actual physical act. And it's specifically addressing those who are Gentiles. How do I know that? Because they're uncircumcised. Okay? They're uncircumcised. And he's saying this, if you do that, then you are severing thing. Yeah, is it for the law or is it for health reasons? And sometimes it may be just for societal reasons. You know, there's there's things related to that. But then there's also, and we actually see it here in just a second, where he's talking about the circumcision and the uncircumcision, where he's using the term circumcision to describe the Jews. Okay, so he's actually describing a people group by that. So you have the physical act, and then you have a people group, but then you have those that in that people group that were circumcised, and Paul's going to say, well, if you're circumcised already, that's okay. Don't worry about that. You can't go back, you know. So you really have to look at the context of what's being said. Uh, within the context of the whole thing, he's using this as the example of going back to the law. Why did he use circumcision as an example of going back to the law? Yeah, well that, that brings a whole lot of stuff to it. Yeah, hang on to that. Well, in this context, they could relate to it. But going back all the way to Abrahamic covenant, yeah, why is it the sign of the covenant? And that goes to the whole thing, why God chose that as a sign of the covenant related to Abraham. There's some wild things here we haven't talked about lately. We actually have discussed some of this in previous courses, but it's been a while. So it's a sign of the covenant. Why that sign? Why not, you know, put a strip of gray hair down the middle of their head? Yeah, it set men apart and it related to the seed of Abraham. How did it relate to the seed of Abraham? <laughs> I hear something way back in the brain of Sabrina starting to come forward. And she's thinking, oh, what was that? We've talked about that before. <laughs> what was that?
Anybody? <clears throat> yeah, biologically, the seed would come through Abraham's seed, Christ, yeah. I think it's actually sort of a cool thing here. Because what is circumcision? Circumcision is a cutting away of the flesh. And it's a cutting away of the flesh at the closest point of paternity. Okay, at the closest point of paternity, paternity between seed and egg. It's the removal of flesh. And removal of flesh is a picture all the way through Scripture. I mean, is it not a picture here in Galatians so far? Okay, of, of the flesh, the dying to the flesh, and etc. And you have that removal of flesh. Uh, exactly, yeah. <laughs> but it is. There's something really that, that's significant about that uh, closest point of paternity of, of, of the seed right there. And actually, even with that covenant thing, uh, when, what was the covenant sign that God gave Noah? Yeah, okay, a rainbow. What's the shape of a rainbow? No, really? What's the shape of a rainbow from God's perspective? It's a circle. You better believe it. Yeah. If you've ever flown and got caught in a thunderstorm or flown, uh, <coughs> most of my flying has been <coughs> from where I am to South Florida. And so you fly over Florida, you see a lot of storms. And a rainbow is a circle. From God's perspective, it's a circle. A circumcision is a circle. Okay. Uh, there's elements of that even in the marriage rings we have as a symbol of a covenant of marriage. You know, that whole type of thing. And so <coughs> there's... God chose this to, yes, set aside his people, to speak vividly to his people that the cutting away of the skin, it was at that point in time. Abraham had already produced a son in the flesh. Once the flesh was removed, he produced the son. Uh, uh, well, no, he and the son uh, of promise had their flesh removed. Then what came forth? The whole line. So look at verse 4. He says, if you receive the circumcision, speaking to the Gentiles, you have been severed from Christ. You who are seeking to be justified by law, you have fallen from grace. Now, who was that? Was that you, Rachel, that said that was an interesting thing? Why is that interesting? Or somebody said something about that earlier up here. Yeah, yeah, isn't that interesting? All of a sudden, all the words start becoming, oh, you want to uh, uh, cut off and remove the flesh right there? You want to sever the flesh from that? If you do that, you're going to be severed from Christ. Why were they going to be severed from Christ? Because they were seeking to be justified by the law. See, this just wasn't a physical act that, hey, maybe I'm supposed to do this. I think I'll do this. Uh, this wasn't something, and this is what Paul was likely being accused of. Because remember how he circumcised Timothy? And that was, you know, the reason Timothy was half Jewish. And where they were going to be going, it would have just been easier. And Timothy agreed to that. He wasn't commanded to do it. He didn't have to. But he agreed to it. Uh, Barbara says, uh, yeah, that they were trying to do this to attain the justification by law. You have fallen from grace. And don't you know that little phrase right there has been used in various ways through the centuries what does that mean you know i, I think that's exactly uh the understanding of it there barbara um then instead of resting in grace you have turned away from grace to being justified by the law now of course people use this all the time saying well see this shows that you can lose your salvation well, there you go See, Lynn and I are within about, um, gosh, about 125 miles of each other right now, so we're thinking alike, you know. <laughs> yeah, some people say, but is this speaking of losing your salvation? Is that what's being said here? Well, that's the idea. The idea is that you're turning away from grace and you're turning to legalism. Uh, and there's a, a, a phrase right here that may help you, Rachel, too. See if I can help. Hold me on this, Sabrina. Make sure I say this right. You ever heard this term right there? I think it's pronounced in nomism. Nomism. 
and let me give you the definition before I forget it. Legalism, I'm, I'm doing this off the top of my head, so don't hold me real tight to this. Legalism is um, seeking to attain righteousness by the law. Nomism is the working out of your salvation and your righteousness by the law. Like your friends, the, the, the lady you were talking about a while ago, Rachel, that's what they're getting caught up in. And anything else plus Jesus is an error. What he's saying right here is that you're turning away from grace, you're falling away from grace, and you're seeking to be justified by the law. <clears throat> is it possible to fall away from grace like that? Okay, now when you get quiet like this, I wonder, you know, if you if I lost you. <laughs> well, there again, we go back to what we were talking about, I think, before we started class. Uh, you have to sort of parse every word. You have to define every word. Here's what I believe is being said here. If you believe that you're saved by grace, you don't need to turn around and start seeking to be justified by the law. If they do turn away, if they do pursue and say that they're justified and they get caught in that, then you never really were saved by grace to start with. And you're definitely not going to be saved by the law. Yes, yeah, a totally different track. Now, I think people can be sidetracked by that. There you go. That they can be distracted by it. You can get caught up in it for a season or however long that may be. You're still saved by grace, though you may be distracted. And that's what was happening with a lot of them. Remember how Paul described it? Who so bewitched you? Remember? He said, you started so well. You were running the race well. Now you're running down the wrong path. He never questioned the true believer's salvation. But he was warning them what was happening. <clears throat> He's saying right here, if you are a Gentile and you come back and you submit yourself to circumcision to place yourself on the law, you need to realize you're going to be on the law and you have turned your back on grace and you never really were under grace. Because if you were really under grace, you wouldn't do this. Verse 5, he says, For through the Spirit by faith, <clears throat> are, um, for we through the Spirit by faith are waiting for the hope of righteousness. And you know, in all of Paul's writings, he speaks of the Lord's coming again. And this is the major time he speaks about it here. He doesn't say a lot about it. But he says that we have hope of righteousness. We're waiting for hope of righteousness. Well, I thought we were righteous already. So what's this talking about? You know, the hope of righteousness in Jesus in this life we have now, but also that the righteousness. There is a particular time when we repent, confess, call upon, believe unto salvation. We are saved. But then there's a the working out of the salvation, the sanctification. Then there's the glorification. And all that comes about as one in the time when we will be with him forever and ever. Yeah, that's it. But then he says this, verse 6, For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. Are you seeing that phrase, in Christ Jesus? In Christ. In Christ. We see it throughout uh, the word. If you're in Christ, the circumcision means nothing. The uncircumcision means nothing. But faith working through love. And there you go. That's where he starts explaining it. What we saw down in verse 14. You want to work? You want a deed? You want a law? It's love. So tell me, which is easier to do? To love in the way that we see the Lord loving in the way that he's commanded us to do? Or to get there and get our religious check boxes out and start checking all the boxes? <laughs> yeah, it's a lot easier to sit there. And you know what? Let's just be real honest with it. It feels a lot better that I can sit there and check off more boxes than Lynn. Because that makes me what? Better and holier and righteous. Yeah, yeah. That is totally it. You cannot love in the flesh. You're right, Rachel. It, it, loving is the complete dependence on the Lord. Because I, I know, you know, <clears throat> I know every one of y'all. Okay? We have been in classes together. I've heard you talk. I've seen you chat. And every one of y'all are just wonderful, marvelous, just the sweetest people in the world. But I also know that not one of you can love in the flesh. You know what I mean? 
<clears throat> None of us can. It's only in the spirit. <clears throat> oh, so let me back up here. <clears throat> yeah, well, overachievers have to overachieve and die in the self, right? Oh, yeah, the better than is less than. <clears throat> is there anything wrong with being goal-oriented task? Not at all. So let's just check off the box of love. Everything oriented in Christ, in Christ, is going to be done in love. If you have to correct somebody, it's going to be done in love. If you have to do this or that, in love, in love, and not in law. And that's what it really boils down to is the juxtaposition between law and love. And this, and Paul's just pouring out his heart to him. Uh, Rachel says it's a weakness for me. I thought chocolate was your weakness, but that's, we'll talk about that some other time. I have to make sure that I'm balancing it by being people-oriented as well. You know, I know exactly what you mean, but I've about decided that's a word that I sort of remove from my vocabulary when I can. I'm just sharing that between us girls here. <clears throat> the word balance. Because I think the walk of the kingdom of God has nothing to do with balance. It has to do with total immersion in love and in the kingdom. And when we're totally in him, when I'm totally dead to self and alive with him, when I abide with him, and don't abide with anything. It's then, and, and I know what you mean by balance, okay? So don't hear me wrong and don't hear me correcting. Yeah, yeah it really is. It, it, it's what is this? Uh, it's probably my problem there, Rachel. Uh, oh, you're balancing chocolate and task oriented? Well, no, because when you eat chocolate, you go about the exercise task and all that kind of thing to to cover your sins, I suspect, you know? So Barbara is a Martha and Mary. That's the reason we need one another. So you're saying Mary is lazy? Is that what you're saying there? <laughs> now look what he, how he brings this home. Verse 7, he says, You were running well. That You were running well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Well, by now, they, they knew who was doing the hindering. They knew what had happened. It was these that were coming in to bring the law. And so, look what he says in verse 8. This persuasion did not come from him who calls you. <coughs> this whole thing we've been talking about up to this point in time in this letter, this did not come. Who distracted you from running so well? Remember, he'd already talked to him about who distracted you from loving me the way you used to love me. <laughs> you know, But now there's something that's distracting you. And this didn't come from the Lord God. And then this great quote that we hear so much in our life. A little leaven leavens the whole lump. So he's acknowledging what? That there's a little leaven there in the lump. But there's also a very positive thing. The lump is basically what? Yeah. <laughs> you talk about it's easier when you say no when you're older. Well, it depends on who's asking. Uh, there's some arenas I never say no. Okay. Uh, that's usually grandkids. <laughs> okay. Uh, then there's other arenas, yeah, you know, that you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, been there, done that. Tried to prove myself that way. Love you, babe. It ain't going to happen again. You know? Look at verse 10, though. I have confidence in you, in the Lord, that you will adopt no other view, <clears throat> but the one who is disturbing you shall bear his judgment, whoever he is. What is Paul saying there in verse 10? <clears throat> if you post what? Verse 10 on Facebook? <clears throat> yeah, well, this was an interesting thing because my uh, son-in-law in North Carolina, Aaron, like I said, he's preaching through Galatians right now, and they're doing Galatians uh, uh, in their small groups. And uh, also, oh, by the way, uh, I know y'all have all seen it because you're all on Facebook and stuff, but I started doing a podcast a couple weeks ago, and this is something I think I'm going to be pursuing until the Lord returns. And I've been doing the podcast on Galatians. And so uh, Aaron's actually using those uh, Galatian podcasts with his small groups in the church. And he and my daughter were sort of concerned because they got this family that comes, Rachel, that's sort of at stage one where your friend is. And they were so afraid that they would be offended. And I said, you can't be fearful of the word of God offending somebody. That's what it's supposed to do. Yeah, 
And so but I, I love this because verse 10, this right here had to be so encouraging to them after everything that he'd been saying to them. Look what he said. I have confidence in you in the Lord. I have confidence with every one of you ladies in the Lord. I have no confidence in any of us in the flesh because I know in the flesh that we will disappoint. I know in the flesh that I will fail you. Okay, I know that in the flesh. That's the reason we need to keep putting the flesh to death. But he had confidence in them in the Lord after saying all this kind of stuff about who's bewitched you, uh, sort of disappointed that you have so easily gone this direction, uh, you know, that you started running well, somebody's hindering you. He's saying this, I know there again in the Lord, say that in Christ, in the Lord, I have confidence in you. I know that you're actually truly saved. I know you're going to make the right decision. I mean, isn't that great? I mean, that right there is so, so encouraging. He says that you will adopt no other view. He's saying, I know that you will see, just because I've been pointing these things out, that the one who is disturbing you, remember their whole point was to disturb them and distort the gospel, that they're going to bear their judgment. And then this whole little thing, whoever he is. Paul very well may not have known who he, who it was. I highly suspect he knew exactly who it was. And he knew exactly who was doing this. And he was not even going to honor them by mentioning their name. You see that happening with politicians. They'll speak of people and not mention their name, or whether they're foreigners or things like foreign leaders, leaders of countries and stuff like that. And it's just like the ultimate slap that you won't even uh, deign to mention their name. And I think he was sort of doing that right there. <clears throat> so everybody still there with me? Uh, yeah, Lynn, I think a lot of times it's a leader that does that. <clears throat> but verse 11, but I, brethren, if I still preach circumcision, why am I still persecuted? I think this is where we see that uh, Paul was uh, being accused of preaching circumcision because of what he had done with Timothy. And these folks would have known about this because Timothy was from that region. So they were saying, oh, yeah, <clears throat> well, Paul believes in circumcision. He did this. And he said, well, if I'm still, if I'm still preaching that, then why am I being persecuted? then the stumbling block of the cross has been abolished. If you're going back to the law, Paul's acknowledging, okay, he's acknowledging the scandal, <clears throat> the scandalon as the Greek is, of the cross. And he said, the cross is not a stumbling block. If you're going back, because uh, the gentleman that Rachel was talking about a while ago is the exact example of what the fruit and the outcome is of all this. So then Paul comes down and <clears throat> talk about graphic, Sabrina. This is Paul at the pinnacle of his in-your-faceness. Would that those who are troubling you would even mutilate themselves or literally cut themselves. <laughs> Why do you love this one, Sabrina? Woo! Uh, I mean, he's sitting there and he's speaking such an encouraging words. I've got confidence in you. I've got confidence that you're going to go the right way. You're not going to listen to the one that's disturbing you. He's going to get his own judgment. You're not going to adopt another view. He says, you know what, I just wish that these folks right here that are troubling you would mutilate themselves. Yeah, maybe you're going to kick out of it. He's literally saying cut themselves. The idea behind this is, oh, yeah, these guys, these Judaizers, they've already been circumcised. I wish they were just neutered. I wish they would just emasculate themselves. I wish they would just remove the seed from themselves where they would no longer propagate the seed of this false doctrine and this false gospel. I mean, that, that, whew, yeah, throw that out of the pulpit on a Sunday morning and see what happens. Uh, we are a little too pretty sometimes, aren't we? But then, where, where was it? Paul wrote somewhere else, I don't remember where, where uh, he was sort of semi-defending himself for a group. And he says, I know what people say. Yeah, Paul's bold in his writing. But then when he comes to us, that he's sort of soft-spoken and he loses, it. you know, he's walking in fear and stuff like that. <laughs> uh, no, I, I think he was both. I think he was bold in both. <clears throat> so what he's saying is that what they are teaching is of such uh, insignificance and so unlike the gospel. I wish they would. If, they, if they're so high on y'all cutting off flesh, well, why don't they just double down on it? You know, and you know what? There have been people through the years that have done it. Okay, 
people through the years that have done that. Uh, I was actually reading a commentary this week related to these passages, and it was speaking about the list that we're about to get to, which we'll have to do quickly. And uh, it was speaking about uh, Jerome, you know, one of the church fathers from long ago and far away. And Jerome was writing about how even when he was living an ascetic life in um, the deserts of Africa, that his mind was still oriented around this list of the flesh that we're about to look at in just a minute. That even when he was among a group of men that had emasculated themselves like this, guess what they still had a problem with? See, you can't cut off the flesh to righteousness. You have to die of the flesh in the power of the Holy Spirit. There's a big difference, a huge difference. So anyway, verse 13, let's press on. For you were called to freedom. Notice he started verse 1. It was for freedom that Christ has set us free. We're actually called to freedom, brethren. Notice how he calls them brethren. Only do, do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, for through, but through love serve one another. There it is. You want a deed? You want a law? It's the law of love. Don't take that freedom and turn it to the opportunity of the flesh, which often, often happens. But through love. And what? how do we manifest the love? Through serving one another. Okay, serving one another. Then verse 14, which we read, we read earlier. For the whole law is filled in one word in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. <clears throat> then verse 15, but if you buy it, devour one another, take care lest you be consumed by one another. Notice that the way he's describing that the law had brought what in? That biting and devouring, uh, literally a, a cutting away of flesh with teeth. Okay, bite and devour taking hunks that this is sort of the path you're going on you know why'd you go this way what made this happen there's a lot of buts yes but he says what verse 16 walk by the spirit and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh so how do you put the flesh to death how do you put the desire of the flesh to death you walk by the spirit and it's just not something you do okay i walk by the spirit today so the flesh is dead i will not have any problems what's going to happen when you wake up that next morning or forget that you can say that right there when you're laying down at night and something's going to happen between you and your spouse before you fall asleep or am I the only one that ever had this, this happen in my life <laughs> okay I'm the only one okay right <laughs> I mean it is amazing how quick the enemy will just sort of stick his fingers in there but the flesh sets this desire verse 17 against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. This is what the real battle is. There's a battle taking place. And it's between the Holy Spirit that dwells within us and the flesh in which he dwells, this corporeal existence. They're in opposition to one another. So you may not do the things that you please. But if you're led by the spirit, you are not under the law. The corollary is what? If you're under the law and you're trusting in the law, and you're doing the deeds of the law to prove that you're saved, you're not being led by the Spirit. There's your one, Rachel. Okay? Yeah. You're not going to be under the Spirit if you're under the law. Now, I love this. Verse 19, the deeds of the flesh are what? How does he describe them? He describes them in one word. The deeds of the flesh are... Evident, which means what? Uh, what are y'all seeing up there right now? Are y'all seeing anything? Oh, here we go. Yeah, that's what I want. <clears throat> yeah, they're obvious. They can be seen. They're external. Everybody can see this. And what are these deeds of the flesh? Well, you got a list of, I think, was there 17 things? Here is a useful thing. I can't remember who did this. This might have been the constable thing, which I'll show you a little more detail in a minute. And... Uh, I don't, this is formatted a little hard to see, but you see the deeds of the flesh are sins of immorality, of idolatry, of animosity, and, and intemperance. You know, there's a lot of ways to categorize these things, but he just says what? They're immorality, impurity, sensuality. These are the deeds of flesh. What else? Idolatry, sorcery, forms of witchcraft. And then enmities, strife, jealousies, outbursts of anger, disputes, dissensions, factions, envy and drunkenness, carousing. And then everybody's favorite one, what? And things like these. 
Why does he say and things like these? Yeah, because he, he wanted to make sure that you understood that this just isn't a um, uh, a list to cover everything. And if you have some other sin that's not in that list, that it's okay to do it. <laughs> you know, not that any of us would do that or anything like that, okay? So that was the reason he said it that way. Uh, that they really are too numerous to number, okay? Too numerous to number. Uh, that little thing that I just threw up on the thing right there, let me kick this over to another place here where I can show you a little better that little list uh this is out of the uh, constable commentary i think i actually put a link to this when we first started the class but if you look at the top up there you'll see where it says constable and he's uh, a professor and he's written the entire commentary on the bible uh, i find it useful it's free you can download it uh, but this is just a great little list of the greek words that describe all these things we really don't have time to go through all of them but you can find them in various commentaries but just what they mean with immorality a fornication and the greek word that it's derived from pornea okay which you think oh that's where we get some words yeah it, it actually is so you know impurity sensuality and then what he calls the religious sins the idolatry and this is so important we've talked about this many times before idolatry is simply worshiping anything but god okay and a lot of what we do is because we're involved in idolatry usually the idol is us because i want it it's what i want i was talking with a lady this morning got this precious little uh lady she's in her late 60s takes piano from me has a lesson at 7 30 on a monday morning Woo! and we were just talking about the things of god related to this and just different things. And I told her, I said, here is the reason we sin as believers. The reason we sin is because we want to. It's not because we have to. We don't have to. We have the Holy Spirit. We don't have to. It's because we want to. And we want to because we have set up ourselves as the number one idol. And then sorcery, various things of witchcraft. This is always interesting. The Greek word that's right here, sorcery and witchcraft, is pharmakia. It's literally where we get the idea of pharmacy and pharmaceuticals, medication, and things like that. And then what he calls societal sins. Enmities, uh, strife, jealousy. Uh, you see uh, different translations translate these things in different ways. Uh, jealousy and envy. Jealousy is when you're jealous over somebody because they've got some. Envy is when you want somebody not to have what they want. Okay? It's, it's jealousy doubled down. Uh, outburst of anger. Uh do you know anybody that professes to be a believer, but they have outbursts of anger? You know, it's, it's, it's sort of a prevalent thing. I was talking with my youngest daughter, who she's a manager of a local restaurant, and we went by there last night because she'll cook for us. And she just sat down. She said, this has been the longest day. And uh, actually, she and uh, the people that work there, they, they really don't like Sundays. You want to guess why they don't like Sundays? Take a wild guess. Are y'all still there with me? Church people. She says they come here, and she told me a half a dozen stories yesterday. Of people, oh yeah, the tips are always very low. Honestly, folks, I think we as the body of Christ, uh, I sort of, I, I'll tell you something I sort of do personally. Uh, uh, I will give the waitress more than I will give to some things that happen at the local church. Yeah. Instead of doing that uh, unbiblical thing that we call tithing within the church, we ought to be s spreading the seed all over the community. We ought to be known. They ought to be fighting over us. Yeah. But she had a half a dozen tables that came in. She said it was obvious that they had just got there from church. Okay. I guess by clothing and stuff like that. And just horrible. Uh, what's taking so long with our food? Why this? 
And she was telling me, she said, if you order the grilled chicken, it's going to take 13 minutes. And she has it all timed out. She says, you know, it took this long to do this. This this is how long it's going to be for the food to rise to your table. She doesn't even get into that detail with them. She's just sitting there looking at them going, these are the ones that profess to be of the kingdom of God. And you know what? I really can't stand you. <laughs> because of what she, And that's what I'm saying. She had outburst of anger yesterday because rolls didn't arrive in time, according to the person that had sat down. And I'm thinking, you know, why do we act this way? And so uh, we're, we're to reject these things. These are all deeds of the flesh, disputes, dissensions, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, uh, I sort of recommend this constable thing. I think it's under the files that we have for our class. It's just really useful to put it all together for us, okay? So uh, he says all these things. Uh, let me jump down to it. Verse 21, envy and drunkenness, carousing. Which, by the way, y'all should have told me I forgot to... Uh, share the scripture i had the scripture to share with y'all tonight up here but that's okay uh and things like these of which i forewarned you what had paul done with them in relationship to all these things he had done what he had forewarned them he had told them and see i think sometimes we uh we forget this he, he had forewarned them. He had already told them, hey, here's what's going to happen. These are the deeds of the flesh. You're saved now, but your flesh is still going to fight against you. And it's still going to want to do this. Okay, your flesh is going to want to do this. He said, but don't do this. I forewarned you just as I have forewarned you. And this right here is pivotal, folks. Pivotal, pivotal. That those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God they will not inherit the kingdom of God <clears throat> uh, John says the same thing over in first John I believe if your pattern and practice of behavior are these things then you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God not because of the way you're behaving but the fact that you're behaving this way is a pattern and practice of behavior reveals that you're not truly saved now, I love that pattern and practice of behavior, okay, because that means, yes, yeah, sometimes you may have an outburst of anger, and that's a sin. You repent, confess, First John 1, and you move on, okay? But if your pattern of life is like this, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. So let's look at these last few verses and close it out. But the fruit of the Spirit is what? And everybody could probably quote this. But folks, there's so much here. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. And now, do we not have far more understanding about this last phrase? Against such there is what? No law. No law. So he's saying now that there is no way that the law is going to, uh, shall we say, stand up to this. Why are you pursuing the law when you can have the fruit of the Spirit in this way? Uh, let me take us over here. Here's just a little chart related to the fruit of the Spirit. Uh, it probably came out of the Rose Bible charts because it's nice and pretty. Okay, uh, If you're watching this as a review or something, you can pause it. Uh, those of you on the live class, I'll put this up on the website where you can look at it later okay but it's just a useful thing to see what the fruit and notice it is fruit a lot of times people will say fruits you know plural of the spirit i understand that i just had to get over myself in relationship to that but i think fruit is important because it tells us that this is what is in every true believer okay every one of us have this yeah, if you're not breaking the law, there's no law to be worried about. But if you're going back to the law, guess what? You're going to be under the law. And he's told us up here, if you're under the law, then you're not led by the Spirit. It said that in verse 18. I think that's sort of a, a pivotal understanding with that. And so this gives a description of it, other scripture passages related to it. And then also you got you know, a little Greek word right there for that type of thing. It's a useful chart. So he's saying this is how we live. We live in the Spirit. We don't live under the law. The last three verses, Paul says this. Now those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with his passions and desire. Yeah, that's great, Barbara. Yeah, that whole picture of the fruit from the tree. We've crucified the flesh with all those passions, all those desires. Verse 25, sort of a synopsis thing. If we live by the Spirit, 
Let us walk by the Spirit. Let us not become boastful, challenging one another, envying one another. And each one of those little statements is just a blow to those Judaizers. He said, if you're going to live by the Spirit, you walk by the Spirit. If you're living by the Spirit, you cannot walk by the law. If you're living by the law, you can't walk by the Spirit. And if you live by the law, you're going to be boastful. I know some people who say that they live by the Spirit and they're very boastful about it. Guess what? If you're boasting about it, you're not living by the Spirit. You do not challenge one another and you're not envying one another. Living by the law will do that. And what we see it within the body of Christ just rampant today where people uh, are living by a religious law. Okay? By a religious law. And there's an undercurrent of challenging. There's an undercurrent of envying. Uh, folks, I see it. Uh, we have a, 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 a good ministerial association within our community here. that We gather together once a month and we just break bread together. And uh, It's had ups and downs through the 50 years of its existence. Uh, the group right now uh, is just the most loving. And you know what? There's just really very little envying of one another. But the sad state of affairs is the denomination that I grew up in, when I meet with them, there is such an envy, there's such an undercurrent of jealousy. Uh, you know, big smiles, big all this kind of stuff, but you can, uh, you, you just wouldn't believe it. It's so sad. And so uh, the Lord is telling us, don't challenge one another. Don't be envying one another. If you walk by the Spirit, live by the Spirit, you won't. If you walk by the law, you will. Yeah, you won't be happy. You won't be happy at all. Huh. Anyway, well, there we go. Our, our time has run out. Anything y'all would like to share real quick related to all this? Was everybody's questions addressed in some form or fashion? Carol? Yeah. This is Carol. Hey, Carol. Hi, I'd like to pray for a friend of mine. Uh, Christine, 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 Christine,
we go to this conference and after that first time, i'm sitting right next to this guy and i can tell he was really uncomfortable so afterwards you know he was leaving and his friend was going to come by and pick him up and so he did and they left so we get back to the room and i look at my other friend and i said how long has he been in this lifestyle and he said how did you know i said well god told me when he walked in the door he was in this and he said, well, and it actually went back many, many years when they served a staff in a, uh, on staff together in California. And they had gone to the Baptist Convention in San Francisco. And the two of them had gotten in a fight. And the other guy was just so upset about it. He thought, well, I'm in San Francisco. I've always wanted to have an encounter like this. I think I'll go have one. And he did. And that's what started it. And so my friend was concerned, you know, what do you do? How do you handle this? Because he was a really good family friend. And I just told him, I said, well, this is sort of what I'm thinking right now, what the scripture might lead us in and what the Lord might be saying. That you hang in there tight with him because you're his only godly friend. But every time you're out with him, you love him and you say you're praying for him and you talk to him about how he's going and what's going on in his life. But you no longer allow him in your home with your family, with your wife and your kids and things like that. You know, you don't allow that. In other words, the scripture tells us to remain aloof, but how do you manifest that? You know, how, how do you work it out? Because you still want to redeem them. And so particularly with a parent, you know, you're there with them. I'm not going to reject you as my child. I'm not going to reject you in this way. But, you know, there's some things you need to understand. Here's what's going to happen. And then you do as, as the Lord leads. And, and it is heartbreaking. Uh, what I find interesting is, that we find some sins more sinful than other sins. You know what I mean? And uh, and there's no doubt there's some that are more obvious and some that are more probably abhorrent in our eyes, uh, but they're all abhorrent in the eyes of God. And so uh, we, we will pray for, uh, for her right now. Uh, there's actually many, many that are like that, uh, either in that kind of lifestyle or, uh, or others. I'll just leave it at that. Okay. Yeah, you want to know that your kid is saved. That's what you know. That's what the bottom. Yeah, that's what the bottom line is, and um, and of course it gets down to that pattern and practice of behavior. Uh, we in our mind, if somebody does something two times in one day's time, we say it's a pattern. Is God looking down in twenty years finding out that that's not a pattern or whatever? I sort of rest on the First Corinthians six passage, you know, verse nine on right there, where God lays out this long list of sins sort because you know paul wrote like four lists of sins like his deeds of the flesh <coughs> and, then, and then paul says and such were some of you you know but you've been washed by the blood and so but that's talking about before they were saved now they're saved the sad thing she's probably involved with what's called a metropolitan church or something like that which will sit there and say oh this lifestyle is fine you know Yeah, and so you have that right there. But then I can sit there and point to church after church out of my background where they sit there and basically say that lying and thievery and gossip is fine too. Seriously. I mean, you know, is it any? Uh, your barber gets point, posting gossip. There you go. Okay, well, let me pray for us. Lord, there's nothing we can do in the flesh to take care of all this stuff, but we know that in the Spirit and in you that all things are possible. So, Father, we do lift up, uh, particularly this this young lady right here. And, Lord, I lift up a friend of mine this, the same exact way in Mississippi, in, in the same type of church, same lifestyle. And, Father, may they, uh, I, I thank you for what's happening with my friend. He's struggling and he's fighting because I think you're dealing with him. And so, Lord, I know that you never give up on us. And so, Lord, may we be there when, uh, as you are dealing. And may we be there, even as we see in the Scripture, Lord, uh, that you have called us to be that fishnet to draw them into the kingdom. Okay, to draw them into the kingdom and to love. And uh, everything we see right here, the fruit of the spirit of the love and joy and peace, patience. To be those of kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Uh, Father, I just thank you for the profound things that you've revealed here. And Lord, show us even more. And may we live out everything to your praise, Lord, and your honor and your glory. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so much. Um, little housekeeping here next week should be our last week uh, i don't remember what i had scheduled in starting uh the next course which we're doing ezekiel right i think we're doing that next uh 
it depends upon what's happening with me. We'll start it that next week. Okay, I think we'll be able to do that. So, uh, but y'all are flexible, and I know that. So, uh, just make sure you get your Ezekiel workbook if you don't already have it. But I think everybody's got it. Uh, bless y'all. I'll see you again next time. Okay, bye bye.